Adrian qualifies as a medical doctor and now is a specialty doctor in emergency medicine, training other junior doctors at Cardiff University. A talk entitled Animal Cruelty and How It's Killing Us, Dr. Adrian Storm.
dietary fats were most implicated were total energy intake and the amount of fruit and vegetables eaten. And if you're feeling smug, if you're from Scotland, Northern Ireland, the uh, dietary situation there is actually <coughs> more less. Overall, life expectancy in Britain has increased at a slower rate than most of our European neighbours. And that's due to, largely due to our poor record on cancer survival, high levels of obesity and spiralling alcohol consumption. And of course, emergency departments like mine, they were used to dealing with the consequences of violence, week in, week out. Fortunately, and I've definitely seen less of it, violence against the person is, is declining, but the figures do remain shocking. Last year, 313,000 people attended emergency departments in England and Wales for treatment following violence. Those at the highest risk of violence were males aged 18 to 30. So that's a, kind of a brief overview of, of what I regard as some important aspects of our national health. So are we justified, am I justified, in making links between animal cruelty and ill health? And I think we are. So, as my sort of alter ego, the animal campaigner, I'm well aware of another contemporary affliction, another epidemic, if you like, which is the, uh, the uh, commodification and exploitation of animal life. And whilst it would be ridiculous to claim that all human disease roots animal cruelty, I think we can make some bold statements about this malign influence on our well-being. So most obviously, as Peter referred to earlier on with his, is his inspirational lecture, Animal Farming. Particularly the intensive variety continues to make us really sick. Partly through the consumption of meat and other animal products that raise our risk of heart disease, diabetes, and uh, other cancers. Now, I'll give you a bit more detail on those shortly. But I think it's also due to the health risks inherent in animal farming itself. Uh, I'm obviously preaching to converted here. I'm, I'm, you're all aware of the horrors of livestock farming. And there's no such thing as humane slaughter. There's no such thing as humane dairy farming. There's no such thing as humane egg production. I would also add that population studies that demonstrate that meat is toxic, they don't distinguish between organic meat or otherwise. And I wish all the apologists would all this so-called welfare food would try a bit harder to get their heads around that. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization has warned intensive global meat production poses a serious threat to human health. These are like swine flu, bird flu, antibiotic resistant superbugs. Last year, there were almost 85,000 cases of food poisoning reported in England and Wales. All the advice from the NHS about how to avoid food poisoning pertains to animal products. The crazy thing is, we're looking for ways to cure all these serious conditions partially caused by diet, but we inflict still more suffering on animals. And we try to recreate some of the illnesses in animals but never normally suffer from them. And then we conduct all manner of experiments trying to make them well again. So, We've made rats fat. We've fed them an obesogenic diet, which makes whole families of rats fat. We allow them to mate, and then we kill the lot and dissect them to find out why they got fat in the first place. We graft tumours into mice that bear no relationship at all to human malignancies. We give heart attacks to rabbits, bypass grafts to pigs, pacemakers to goats, and we chop up dogs to the point of absolute biological absurdity. An ongoing campaign by Amelaide has highlighted how these major charities like British Heart Foundation and Cancer Research UK are pouring millions into animal experiments such as these. But they're not delivering the goods. This is the point. For cancer, we've got a continual stream of high-profile and costly drug failures that show no signs of stopping. The success rate of cancer drugs in clinical trials is around 10%. So it's woeful. And the occasional studies only makes that fact more the success only makes that fact more glaring. And these drugs have been developed using animal models which are acknowledged even by cancer researchers to be poorly predictive. In other words, animals do not suffer the disease we do, and nor do they react to treatments in the same way. Their suffering does not alleviate ours. Cancer Research UK claimed in a letter to us that research in animals has underpinned virtually all the progress that has been made in understanding and treating cancer over the past century. We asked them to back up, back up that assertion with hard data, and they went quiet on us. And their view clearly differs from a research fellow at the drug company Eli Lilly, who declared, if you look at millions and millions and millions of mice that have been cured, and you compare that to relative success, or lack thereof, which achieving the treatment of metastatic cancer disease, clinically, you realize there just has to be something wrong with these models. 
It's not surprising to me that so many drugs fail when the research underpinning them <coughs> is so flawed. We use a primitive technique of grafting human cancers into mice. The mouse xenograft model it's called. And that model still provides most proof of concept data for new cancer therapies. But using mice in this way is even regarded by Cancer Research UK as outdated. I'll give you a following quote from their Cambridge team. It's all about mice, mouse xenograft models. Xenograft models of human cancer do little to replicate the real disease and are essentially an in vitro petri dish. It is therefore not surprising that xenografts have an altered response to chemotherapeutic drugs. The time for reliance on such models to determine the response to a new therapy has passed. The same Cancer Research UK staff at Cambridge Institute are committed to continued use of xenograft models for the tumours of major interest. So the contradiction here is glaring and demands full public scrutiny. Why are they saying on the one hand the xenograft model is outdated, on the other hand they're committed to its continued use? No wonder these therapies are failing. With regard to heart disease, Regenerative medicine, making us kind of semi-biologically bionic, is now being hyped as the new holy grail of cardiology. <laughs> the British Heart Foundation wants to spend £50 million of public money, money that us, the public, will donate, to find out, amongst other things, why our hearts do not mend themselves like zebrafish or newborn mice, to find out why they don't do it. It is despite a total lack of scientific evidence that these heart amputation studies on mice or fish ever translate to clinical benefit. Stem cells, gene transplants, they failed to help heart patients after looking great in animal models. And during the last 30 years, hundreds <coughs> of heart failure drugs have been developed using animal models, with very few making it to clinical trials on patients. A particularly wasteful 20-year obsession has been a search for antioxidants, substances which are meant to protect ourselves against the effect of uh, free radicals. They're not unfortunately recently liberated animal life protesters, but their own um, molecules produced when our bodies break down food or by environmental hazards like tobacco smoke and radiation. And these were presumed up until recently to be toxic to our cardiovascular systems. Lots of positive animal studies, often involving poisoning rats, uh, rabbits with cholesterol. Randomized trials in humans have been a complete flop. The British Heart Foundation have funded a series of lethal physiology experiments on beagle dogs recently did a demonstration highlighting this in Leeds. The dogs have had their chests opened, their spinal cords cut, their blood drained and recirculated via external reservoirs, and the nerves to their brains, kidneys, gut, and diaphragms were all severed. They tell you it was under anaesthetic. It was an experiment under terminal anaesthesia, therefore the dogs didn't suffer. We have reason to believe that their levels of anaesthesia in some cases were not even adequate, and their pain response was still present. If that were not shocking enough, Experiments have been criticised, and I quote, redundant, poorly reproducible, internally inconsistent, physiologically unsound, and medically irrelevant, by Dr. John Pippin, who was a former Harvard Medical School faculty member and a heart specialist. The Leeds team has not at any point claimed any direct relevance of its work to human medicine. In many cases, it doesn't claim it's relevant to human physiology, let alone disease. So what are violence? Talked about violence earlier on, it did a step too far. Uh, you know, a baseless polemic to, to claim a connection between Saturday night punch ups and animal suffering. The link between animal abuse and human violence, violence is undeniable. It's been very well studied in actual fact. There was a clear correlation between animal abuse, family violence, and other forms of community violence. Child abuse and animal abuse are linked in a self perpetuating cycle. Criminal psychologists acknowledge that participating or viewing acts of repeated cruelty towards animals desensitizes both the perpetrator and the spectator. John Locke, 17th century Enlightenment physician and philosopher, wrote about children and animals way back in the 17th century. And he said that tormenting and killing beasts will by, de by degrees harden their minds even towards men. And they who delight in the suffering and destruction of inferior creatures will not be acted very compassionate or benign to those of their own kind. His words are still obviously very true. Today. Animal cruelty destroys respect for life. And children who witness animal abuse are at greater risk of becoming abusers themselves. Men who abuse animals are five times more likely to have been arrested for violence towards humans, four times more likely to have committed property crimes, 
and three times more likely to have records for drug and disorderly conduct offences. This is not just random, lone examples we're talking about. Organised cruelty to animals, still inflicted in the name of sport. We've seen one there, legal or otherwise. Hunting with dogs, responsible for some of the grossest acts of animal cruelty ever perpetrated. It continues as a minority pastime practiced by hardcore criminals. They've been described by John Cooper QC, one of Britain's leading barristers, as a deviant subgroup based on an institutionalised ethos of violence. This comes as no surprise to me, or to those of us who do monitor hunts for illegality and try to prevent the killing, the continued killing of wild animals. We know the terrier men who dig out the foxes to be baited with dogs, bludgeoned or shot, are often badger diggers in their leisure time. <coughs> their cruelty knows no species boundaries. They regularly take their own children out into the field to witness and learn acts of barbarism firsthand. We've seen them doing it. The police and the RSPCA know these individuals are frequently involved in other serious and violent crimes, and they've got the criminal records to prove it. The hunt of the Tybeside hunt in West Wales was convicted earlier this year of assaulting one of our monitoring group, a 76 year old man. And police are currently investigating a shocking case of serious assault on my wife in connection with another local hunt. Almost every week, it seems, hunts out and monitors are subjected to physical violence, intimidation, or criminal damage. As John Cooper QC points out, these incidents do not prove beyond all doubt that hunting contributes to a wider abuse of culture, but there's a great deal of very suggestive anecdotal evidence that points in that direction. So before moving on, a purely personal point of view, which I haven't got any research papers to back up. But I, I believe animal cruelty causes deep sadness in our society. Many of us in the animal rights movement have sometimes felt burnt out mentally by the constant barrage of cruelty we have to encounter. But I believe that wider society pays a price for its knowledge of and complicity in acts of abuse. Nobody wants to be told their lifestyle or habits, like the consumption of animal products or their support for a medical charity, for example, are the direct cause of significant suffering. Yet to bring about change, we must bring this knowledge into the light. And that knowledge can be deeply traumatising and upsetting. Initial anger can be replaced with a kind of a hauntedness or a powerlessness at the sheer scale of abuse. And transforming these negative emotions uh, is very hard for some people. So, we must continue working towards a preventative solution, I believe, and a better quality of life all round. The tragedy is that most of the ailments I've spoken about are preventable. A claim that abolishing animal cruelty would abolish heart disease or cancer or violence would be ridiculous, but it would certainly help. What we need most is, is a lot of prevention, a double dose if we like, of prevention. We must prevent cruelty to animals and that should go hand in hand with prevention of disease. There are good reasons to believe we do not eat animals, experiment on animals, or hurt animals for pleasure, our common lot would improve. Let's take diet first. Cancer is a largely avoidable disease. It's estimated by decent scholars that 90 to 95% of the risk of cancer has its roots in environmental causes and lifestyle. Alcohol consumption and obesity are credited with giving the British women a 17% higher risk of cancer than the European systems. But it's also clear that eating animal products have a sinister part to play. The incidence of cancer in vegetarians is over 10% lower overall across the board. Interestingly, vegans were included in a massive European investigation into cancer and nutrition, but there were too few cancers among them to be informative for the study. <laughs> in, contrast, in contrast, the consumption of meat, especially red or processed meat, is conclusively linked to an increased risk of several cancers and an overall greater risk of dying. And recently, even a modest consumption of eggs has been shown to increase the risk of developing lethal prostate cancer among healthy men. The Deputy Head of Science for the World Cancer Research Fund said in August, on average, women in the UK are more likely to be overweight to drink more alcohol than the European average. And this is a concern because both these factors increase cancer risk. Okay. But, she also went on to say, together with other factors, such as being physically active and eating a healthy, plant-based diet with too much salt, without too much salt or red or processed meat. These changes can make a real difference to the number of women 
who developed cancer before the age of 75. Not so long ago, you wouldn't have got a world reputable head of science even mentioning plant-based diets. We are clearly making progress. With regard to coronary heart disease, smoking, obesity and physical activity are top of the list. And they're all amenable to society changes. But again, we find plentiful evidence that going vegetarian, or even better, vegan, has clear benefits. Large-scale population studies demonstrate clearly that veggies have less chance of developing or dying from coronary heart disease. Vegans in particular are far less likely to be obese, develop type 2 diabetes, or have high blood cholesterol than meat eaters. They also have modestly lower blood pressure than the meat eating equivalents, who for their part have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So there's plenty of health benefits in being vegetarian or better vegan. The current government, however, it's got no stomach for a fight with the food industry over its peddling of what are essentially toxins. It won't upset the powerful vested interests of livestock farming. We heard about earlier on the very, very powerful vested interests involved in farming. From the, the whole chain of farming is, uh, is essentially dominated by powerful vested interests. And the mass media, as we've seen, is unless prompted and encouraged, which it can be, is usually only tokenistic in its treatment of the veggie agenda, and sometimes, as we still see, it's openly hostile. So where does the prevention blueprint and the promotion of an animal-free diet need to come from? The obvious answer is that it needs to come from us. Animal groups, uh, and what we do, we're making all the running right now. We must continue to do so in the knowledge that what we're doing is right for people as well as animals. Are the charities, the well-heeled big medical charities, they're going to wade into the breach, they're going to help us out? Not yet. Disease treatments, like they, they earn big bucks. Preventative advice and investigation is, is, is low cost, low input. There's not much money to be made there. Cancer Research UK consistently spends the lowest proportion of its research budget on prevention. It has, however, formed interesting collaborations with several commercial interests, such as AstraZeneca, and offers pharmaceutical companies the unique opportunity to enhance potential return on previous investments. And it's a charity. It's chairman of the board of trustees was previously an executive director of AstraZeneca PLC. The British Heart Foundation, despite enjoying an overall increase in income last year, cut its prevention and care spending by £3 million. These bodies, and much of academia, the university culture, is still too wedded to the mad science of animal experiments. It's another socially sanctioned, well-organised, big money bracket that we're better off preventing. Progress away from animal experimentation has been far too slow. Partly because of the endless repeated mantra that we hear, there is no alternative, even when they clearly exist. I'll give you two quotes to show they do clearly exist, and you can hear them back to back. We did a recent animal aid briefing, and we looked at the successful development of human tissue models of breast cancer. And the researchers described how their breast cancer model was, and I quote, advantageous over animal models as they more closely represent human disease and unlike animal experiments allow us to mimic the complex cellular interactions occurring in breast cancer. Cancer Research UK told us that experiments on mice are still necessary because the complex interactions between cells and tissues that occur during the development and spread of cancer in the human body cannot as yet be properly reproduced using other methods. It sounds almost exactly the same. Once our researchers have done it, Cancer Research UK says you can't do it. The alternative does not exist. Is it deliberate denial? Is it ignorance? Either way, we must stop being seduced by the, the cosy image these charities have carefully nurtured. We scratch the surface, and it's hard to be convinced that they are serving the best interests of either human or animal welfare. There's other prominent advocates of the status quo, other vested interests start cheaping up. Lord Willis of Knaresborough, the chairman of the Association of Medical Research Charities, he recently waded into the fray on behalf of his members. And he exploited his membership of the House of Lords to ask a Home Office Minister what steps will he or the government take on campaigns such as those led by Animal Aid, which he said could be incredibly dangerous to the health of our research base. He didn't say that it could be incredibly dangerous to our collective health, though, did he? The health of our research base. Every passing year, 
This kind of technologies now exist to replace large numbers of animal experiments with humane alternatives. Cell cultures, organs on chips, they are now poised to become centre stage if they were given the opportunity in toxicology and drug development. But we've still got vested interest vociferously lobbying the government to water down protection for laboratory animals. And we cannot be complacent. We must continue to nip and bite at their ankles. Our message is right. It is ethical for all concerned. Finally, we must also strive to make society as zero tolerant of violence towards animals as it is towards people. All opportunities, we must publicise the link between the two. Cruelty begets cruelty. Animal abusers must face fines and even jail sentences that properly reflect the seriousness of their crimes. The farce that is trail hunting, this, this farce they've brought in where they pretend they're hunting a trail and just actually go after the live quarry, must be banned. As should shooting and racing animals for sport. The police, that have been up until now largely complicit or unbothered by many forms of wildlife crime, were at last showing some very small signs they're waking up. We must nag them to finally get out of the beds of the hunters and file for a divorce. To sum up then, I think it's vital for us when we campaign to make explicit the links between animal cruelty and our own well-being. A society that treats animals with disdain or malice is a sick society, for many reasons. When we push for a better deal for other species, we're acting as agents of change for a healthier culture, physically and probably mentally as well. But our message is a profoundly fair one. Let's be confident about it. Cancer. You know, we can 
we can work together on it rather than trying to alienate people. I think that's, if we go at it in a sympathetic frame of mind, I think we can make progress, <coughs> but I don't think it depends on individual, you know, lobbying individual people. It's going to, we have to go much higher than that to try and change the environment that we exist in, I think. That's, that's crucial. Yes, sir. I liked your talk, Doctor. I went to my doctor in 1984 and said, I've gone vegan. And my doctor then said to me, you'll be dead within seven years. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't what I really wanted to talk about. What I, to say <laughs> I took a second opinion from another doctor, who happened to be an Indian doctor, as opposed to wife, uh, an Indian doctor, and he said to me, what's the problem? What's your problem? But it was interesting in contrast. Mm. My, my comment really is this. I always say to people, if animal experiments worked, the hospitals would be empty. <laughs> no, it's the, the fact is we, 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 haven't, we haven't developed anything like cures. I mean, there, there is the old success. There is the odd drug, and some of these drugs that, that, that the 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 section will be tout as being success stories have often come through a fairly checkered pathway towards drug marketing. Anyway, there were animal experiments that went a bit wrong or didn't seem to be right. They did a whole load more experiments on a different species, and then that finally worked. So even the ones they touted as great success stories, like tamoxifen for breast cancer, very very misleading animal experiments initially developed with tamoxifen. In fact, it always got chucked in the bin because it didn't seem to work. Um, so. I mean, we've got the odd success story, but there's so few and far between. They, they, there is the exception rather than the rule. And what we, of course, we see in the news, we see all the time uh, success story, good drug, it works, it was initially produced on mice. What you don't hear about is all the failures. You have to go and look at the, the facts regarding the overall picture, the holistic picture, to find out that the, the, the rate of failure after, after successful trials in animals, developed on the successful animal models, is pretty appalling, and that's where we've got the problem. We only hear about the success story, and of course, by, by its very nature, de facto, a drug that comes onto the market that works um, will be a success. And the, but the misleading, the, the, the propaganda way we use that drug say that that has to have had animals to develop it, and what's more, if it wasn't for the use of animals, this drug could never have made the market, and that just simply isn't true.
She wrote to their office to say there was a reliable alternative to Botox testing. And to say that the, as the drug company hadn't conducted its own independent research, that's right, isn't it? Um, the, the, the regulator couldn't yet approve it. Unfortunately, a bit of good news that the Botox thing is just looks like it's going to be approved. There is an alternative now which they're, they're picking up on, which will be much more widely used. So I think Botox for toxicology testing is going to be phased out very, very quickly, which is you know, one good thing on the horizon. Um, yeah, getting over the, the inbuilt inertia in the regulatory process is a major part of the struggle. Um, I mean, obviously, we're not the only organisation by any means working on this. It's, this uh, Safe Medicines yeah, campaign have been absolutely fantastic in trying to push um, the regulatory side of it in a, in a very, um, a very science-based and sensible and um, you know non in a way which of language which is which is appealing to science and, and regulators. I think that's the, another way we need to go. We need to look at the science of these things and, and just really come, if we're going to look at the regulatory issue, the science of this stuff is rubbish, it's poor, it's doing nobody any favours. Some, in some ways, I know it sounds a bit anathema to, to animal campaigners, it's, it's, sometimes it's good to actually get the cruelty aspect just pushed to one side slightly and concentrate on the fact that it's poor science. And then, hopefully better regulatory approaches may come in. If you're doing something after all which is financially useless and, and is people leading to drug failure after drug, after drug failure, a better, a better model to be used initially in drug development or toxicology testing or whatever would surely be in everybody's best interest, including you know, the finance. So I think that might be a way to go that sometimes if we're concentrating too much on the animal cruelty, we want to sometimes just go into the real the real nuts and bolts of, of the pure science. And that's not necessarily animal aid today, but it's a, other organisations are working on it very well. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how you thought we could get prevention much higher from the agenda. I mean, people who were first involved in picking up the health service in Britain, you know, sort of pioneers, like, you know, kids with health centre, that was all about diets and exercise and fresh air. Mm. Almost all about prevention, very little about you know, expensive drugs or, or covering them up. So that was really the sort of foundations of our health service. Coming back in the last years, the things like the start programs and working families and healthy diets and healthy young children. Mm. But some of those programs have been the first things that they've kind of government have cut. cut yeah. So the, the prevention been, the charities are cutting the the, 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 the prevention money. The governments are cutting, like you say, all these. They regard as optional bolt-ons, aren't they? The, the prevention programs, rather than the actual total essential part of our well-being. Um, I think. The cuts, the adverse economic situation is going to be bad in the short term. But I think overall, a bit more positive note, I think we are seeing a bit of a sea change in how the understanding of this of the diseases are, are developing. And I think once we get over this adverse economic um, phase that we're in, I think we stand, we stand, we're well poised to push the prevention message over and over again. Um, Simply, perhaps from a financial point of view, as much as anything else, the, the, the disease burden is costing the NHS a, a vast amount of money. Um, I think I don't want to knock individual patient groups that are suffering these diseases, but overall, it, the, the spending on it is becoming almost unsustainable in terms of purely preventable diseases. Um, and I think we can rope in, I think as Peter alluded to earlier on, we can rope in separate strands of our argument. Um, to, to serve our, the agenda of ourselves and animals. And if we can point out the fact that disease, the disease burden is unsustainable, and we must look at better ways of living and eating, um, I think we've got it all to play for. I think we've got a positive time now. We can push the prevention agenda. And it, it's not just one particular way of doing it. A campaign like this, or, or just mainstream campaigning. So, you know, our, our Western diet is, is loaded in animal fats and essentially quite bad for us. That message is, I think, it's being received. You know, we've got the, the chief scientist, the deputy chief scientist from the from the World Cancer Research Fund, talking about plant-based diets. Um, I think we're going to go. We've got the ball in our court. We just need to keep running with it. And every little scope we've got, push it. Um, friends, neighbours, <coughs> but most of all, policymakers. Yeah. I was hoping as a doctor you'd be able to maybe give me some advice. I'm on thyroxine, which I have to stay on for life. Oh, do you want a private consultation? Or do you want to do some <laughs> <laughs> But the problem that I've got is I'm vegan and it contains lactose. And they will not issue me with any lactose-free thyroxine. 
because they, they say under ethical reasons, I can't do it because of lactose intolerance because it contains so little that it wouldn't have an effect. And under ethical reasons, they won't give it to me because of the expense. And I don't know what to... Because the expense? Yeah, I don't know what to... So expense. there is an alternative. There is you a liquid. There is a liquid. Yeah. But you, is it your GP prescribing it for you? Mm. And they won't prescribe it because it costs too much. I think they have to get it from America or something like that and they say it costs too much and they will not, they won't do it. Unfortunately, your GP is, is at liberty as a fund holder to, to he, he is legally within his rights to, to refuse to prescribe you um, on those grounds. Um, one thing that does occur to me you might be, and this is just again purely off the top of my head, a personal thing. You know that guy recently that got um, that went to court for his animal rights beliefs. That got he was looking for a garden centre or something. He was at Hunt Sam, and he got he got kicked out. But he took him to court, and he said that his his um, views amounted to a, a religious belief, and it should be enshrined in, in his legal rights, the same as you know racism, homophobia, etc. Mm. He won his case. Could you make a case to your GP that this was part of your religious belief system? And therefore, they were, they were discriminating against you unfairly. Yeah. Because um, I know from the financial point of view, you, you, you'd be stuck. They wouldn't. No. They're, they're illegally allowed to do it. Yeah. You can't stop taking your thyroxine without adverse health consequences. Yeah. Um, but perhaps you could try and say that this, this case law, this precedent, if, if he was discriminating against you because you were you were you were black or you yeah. were gay or something, whatever they stand on, yeah. is he discriminating financially against you because of a belief system? Yeah. <coughs> Thank I'm you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah. Good point. Contact your primary care trust. See if they've got non discriminatory policies, for example. And see if they National Primary Care Trust. The, the primary, your, your, all the, um, it's been reconfigured again, but basically it's all gone into health boards now, which is GPs are uh, essentially kind of merging with the hospital setups. And it's all going to be reconfigured again shortly with this new commissioning thing. But primary care trusts mm. are responsible for making fund holding decisions and allocating resources. So if you, if you make sure they're bound to some sort of policy against yeah. non-discrimination, yeah. you could try and talk that against them. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Could we make this the last question? I'm sorry, yeah. I'm just interested to know in your own working environment, do you get support from your work colleagues? Do you find that they um, are against you and the medical fraternity among whom you work? How, how do they view your views? Generally supportive once they know the fact. Yeah. You can't be like a, a gay, really. It, it, gives the wrong tone. But um, generally once people are informed about the, the reliability of animal experiments, the cruelty of animal experiments, and the fact that alternatives exist, I think you'd have to be a real diehard if you're if you're kind of non if you no allegiance to begin with to 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 not to find that a compelling argument. So most of the time I'm dealing with people who really haven't thought of the issue to be honest. But once you do sit down in this passionate way and just explain the facts, then most people are generally pretty supportive. I found very few people that I've had difficulties with. One, one foreign doctor, um, he was from Latvia or something, and he was a real hunting guy. He asked me where to buy hunting dogs and stuff. And I, got a stick. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he got the t-shirt wrong. So, but anyway, he, um, <laughs> he, he asked me, and I started talking about the animal experiments thing, he started googling frantically for drugs that work after being tested in animals, and he was a bit weird, but overall, people have been very supportive, so yeah, I think you can take heart. But if you get the facts across, I think it's good. Yeah. I'm afraid we've gone out of time for this session. I, I believe we're maybe around outside. Yeah, it's not a good update. Because we have to set up for the next one. <laughs> Can I just say a big thank you to Adrian?